Welcome, Ecom Logistics Nation. Thank you for joining today's episode. We're on a mission to share e commerce logistics insights, trends, successes, and challenges from the leaders and innovators in our space. If you have some level of an alerting or some level of a communication, right, if it can predict there's going to be a problem because it understands the way things are going and what it expects will be happening next because it's evaluating that. And then it says, hey, we think we're behind. And, and, and oh, by the way, here's the four different things I think you could choose between to, to resolve that problem. Like, yeah, go get it. Welcome, Ecom Logistics Nation. This episode, Nanad and I welcome Blake Corm, Director of Product Management at Manhattan Associates. Blake started as a consultant with Manhattan after graduating from Georgia Tech with a BS in Industrial and Systems Engineering. Over the past 13 plus years, he has transitioned from the consulting side of the business to the exciting world of product management. All of that experience under one roof at Manhattan. Really excited to have you joining us today, Blake, and welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Appreciate it. Welcome, Blake. So, Blake, to get started and to kick things off, uh, spending your career at Manhattan, you've seen so much transformation and innovation in our space. Would love to start with you sharing your journey at Manhattan. You know, as you ascended in the company from the consulting side to where you are today on the product management side. Yeah, absolutely. As you, as you said, uh, industrial engineer by school and uh, WMS expert by, by trade, I suppose. Um, so, you know, I came came straight to Manhattan out of college uh, with an IE background. Um, it was put into the WMS practice um, as a consultant and um, spent a decade uh, in, the, in our services organization. So I uh, very quickly took on the role of, of you know, project lead and, and design lead and design architect and yada, 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 and um, really kind of moved from project to project, usually having three or four projects at a time. So I've just seen, you know. Dozens, if not hundreds, of warehouses at this point in time. Worked on dozens of dozens of different customers and, and seen you know, just uh, quite a bit. And so, a few years ago, uh, a little over a little over three and a half years ago now, uh, Brian Kinsella, who leads our our product management team, said, "Hey, you know, have you ever you ever thought about coming you know coming to this side of the house?" And and my my honest answer to him was no, because I just not something that crossed my mind. Because like people that do this at Manhattan, generally speaking, are you know, very, very tenured, even more tenured than me. 13 years is relatively young in the, in the product <laughs> management space, frankly. But um, but no, it was an opportunity I certainly was happy to, to dive into and take advantage of. And, um, you know, you know now you know, sharing ownership over Manhattan Active Warehouse Management and Yard Management, a few other things in the works. It's um, just been a great, great experience really kind of seeing it from this side of, uh, side of the aisle, as it were. Dude, I got to say, man, you know, arguably... Arguably, probably the most advanced warehouse management system and leading the product for that. I mean, that's an achievement. Uh, so congratulations on that. And uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I would also agree, right? Like most people that would step in in a consultant role, right? Like would look up to the folks that are actually building the solution that you are implementing. You'd be like, someday I'll get there. But it's a 10 year thing, right? <laughs> yeah. And for you to be able to move up so quickly and be able to achieve that, that's uh, commendable. Um, and uh, also commendable is uh, the the quality of the solution because I've got hands-on experience with uh, pretty much every version of it uh, since uh, I would say early 2000s at this point. So um, my it's, first it's, version was 2008, so all right. pre-platform, then every version of platform, SVP, what we called it at that point in time. And then obviously we've had an active WM now, which doesn't have versions anymore. So if you, if you worked on it ever, you, you've worked on it now. So That's amazing, man. That's amazing. And, and like, maybe uh, that's where we kind of dig into that, right? Like what has been the evolution according to you of WMS? Like if you live by like a principle to look at the world from your standpoint, and it's not just Manhattan, right? Like the industry itself. How has the role of a warehouse management system, and I'll I'll go beyond to say supply chain execution systems, right? All of these things that help you execute upon the supply chain itself. How has it evolved uh, over the the last decade or two? Yeah, I mean, you know, in, in my experience, I I think you hit the nail on the head, right? That it's it's no longer these siloed solutions, right? So having a, a warehouse management solution in and of itself adds benefit, certainly, 
But as you get away from silent solutions and get into, you know, what I saw was getting into integrated solutions, which which are still siloed in their own right, in their own world, but they at least can communicate with one another. You start to open up additional opportunities and advantages. And what, you know, the term that we use in Manhattan, at least, is unified solutions. That's really what we perceive our Manhattan Active Solution as, right, which is more of a singular application. And you think about cloud solutions that have, you know, API exposed applications that then in that environment, really, um, the term Gardner uses is compostable architecture, right? If you can deploy these applications in a compostable way so that you can say, hey, I'm, I'm really interested in the WM space. Great. Let's leverage that. But also I need yard management and I need a little bit of TM over here. And how can those um, executions or those, those supply chain execution needs interact, execute, form, function, et cetera, et cetera, as a single application, right? As a single composable application, leveraging, again, more cloud native API first. So that, that was really the experience that I had starting on, well, you know, when we've pre platform right? So far, very legacy, very solid, right? Even, even at that, in that day and age, like our labor management solution was, uh, was a separate deployment in all of this, right? Yep. Getting to integrated solutions and starting to see more, you know, problem solve with that. And then I think, you know, where we're headed, certainly, and where we think that the industry is headed, is more to getting to more of a unified approach, which is there aren't there aren't those needs anymore. And actually, I was at a customer site last week, and they were giving us their roadmap vision of of what they have today from a transportation and a WM space, and they don't they don't ca- talk about them at all. Right? I mean, they use the term warehouse, of course. They use the term transportation, of course. But when they talk about the solutions, they talk about them as supply chain solution. The supply chain solution needs to do this. The supply chain solution needs to do that, right? right? And and to them, if if it's more of a transportation solve because that's the best way to approach it, or it's more of a warehouse operational solve because that's the way to tackle it, all well and good. It's a supply chain solution at the end of the day, and you have to get your supply chain end to end right. And and I think that that vision and hearing that play back from a customer, I know Manhattan has said this in you know in the market for a number of years now, but hearing that play back to me from a customer's perspective was just fantastic to hear because it's like. You know, it's, it's not just us. It's actually resonating in the market and people are going to be thinking about go, you know, going in that direction. That makes so much sense, uh, that though. I do have to ask. Right. So we went, you explained the end to end visibility aspect of things or the end to end control of the execution of how well you do it by bringing these various components together and talk about compostable. Right. Do you see a spectrum that goes down to the micro level? Because we just spoke about the macro, right? On, on, at the micro level, I just want the core receiving capability as an example coming out of a system like yours, right? Or just give help me with an API to just figure out the algorithm to put something away. Do you see a universe where, you know, we go down to that just access to a microservice level application? I think I think that there's... Uh, call it use case or benefit for having expose API in that model. But I think it's still in the greater scheme of, of the overall warehouse and facility need. Right. Hmm. And so, so what I mean by that is you might have some need or applications. Let's take your example of a put away API, right? It's a, it's a great one because we actually, you know, like leveraging that API and understanding that execution is certainly key to actually performing the specific function. Right. But when we think about other needs for that, right, when we think about, for instance, a yard need, right, if a yard's going to be moving something to a dock door, the yard understanding how put away is going to ultimately, es- you know, execute right. is, is, is huge, right? So the interoperability of, of being able to make those one-off API calls is certainly, I mean, we're, we're, we're living, seeing that uh, re- real time. Now, that's still in the context of a larger solution overall. So, you know, Having a facility that only performs high level sophisticated receiving and then does paper based everything else yeah. probably doesn't make a ton of sense. But yeah. in the context of that overall solution, being able to execute and run against individual API or individual calls, a, a thousand percent agreed. And that, Absolutely, that makes a ton of yeah. sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, Blake, you know, you, you just, there's a lot of terminology that was just floated out there, right? Cloud native, <laughs> single application integrated solutions, unified approach. And, you know, if you think about when you started your career 13 years ago, that's probably like all Greek. And, you know, to what what we were talking about back then. And I'm, I'm just curious, you know, from your vantage point, if you could give some advice or you've seen a lot of 
digital transformation projects. So going from like on-prem to this new, um, you know, this new way of managing your supply chain with a cloud native application, like what, from your perspective is fundamental for success as an enterprise level organization is looking to, to go down this path. Do you have any advice as to, um, what that road looks like for, for success? You know, I, I, I don't know that the SaaS model changes what I, at least, you know, my, my decade of services implementation would say is, you know, having clean requirements, a well thought out and, and, and realistic timeline and plan of execution and, you know, being able to adapt along the road to when those, when all those best laid plans go to, go to go awry. I think that has, has <laughs> always been, you know, what I've seen successful projects, right? You know, when the, when the customer comes in either with uh, no clearly defined uh, uh, or moving target of requirements, or if the timeline doesn't fit, you know, what you're trying to do, like you're never, you're setting yourself up for failure, right? You might go live, but you didn't go live with what you actually needed to, or, you know, you didn't go live on the schedule you wanted, but, you know, it's because you were trying to get to something. And so someone's not happy in the end. And, um, you know, in the warehouse world, we all, we see it too often, like the warehouse operators, they're going to get the job done, right? They're going to get yeah. the boxes out. They're going to get stuff shipped. And that could be at the detriment to the overall solution in, 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 in certain instances or, or what the intentions were, but, you know, they're, you know, those, the, the warehouse workers of, of, of certainly that I've worked with, you know, they're, they're getter, they're getting things done. Like they're trying to get it executed done. So they'll find a way, but that doesn't mean that you, you know, set them up for the best success. Right. So. Yeah. And on that, I'll also say that garbage in, garbage out. Right. So if it's not very well executed strategy in a, you know, WMS implementation, I'll speak to that specifically. Um, and operators, as Blake said, you just got to get your job done. They get the job done, but in doing that job, yeah. the data that gets inputted into the system is so wrong that the real pain is about to come down a month from then or three months or six months after. And that's when the real problems start rearing their ugly head, right? Like that's right. that's where the problem happens to be. So like having that, to, to, to Blake's point, right? Like just having that really good, clear project plan, being yeah. realistic in planning, is super important. And I come from the 3PL universe myself, where we usually don't have realistic planning. Everything's <laughs> a go, go, go project. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the first thing that you can drop and you should never, please dimension and weigh your items before bringing them in. If you don't <laughs> yes, do that right, yes. you're going to pay for it. You are really going to pay for it. Every subsequent step is now impacted. Your put away, your replan, your, your yep. slotting, your everything. Yep. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. I think, the, I think the, the big thing I would add to that, that gets you to your initial go live. But when you, and, that, and that's a very traditional on prem answer. And, and the, the more I think about it, right, if you get to a SaaS model, anyone who's then in a SaaS model, right, you're, you're never having that big go live push ever again, right? Generically speaking, you're, you're, but you are having to then evaluate on whatever the solution's release schedule is, right? So we're on quarterly releases every 90 days. But if you're on a SaaS subscription, some subscriptions are annual or whatever, you have to evaluate those, right? And so there has to be some method to the madness of saying, hey, all these new capabilities are available. Which one of these makes sense to us? And so that's a model that, you know, traditional and an on-prem world customers would look at in that, in that upgrade cycle. So every right. uh, three, to, three to five years, give or take, right? And so now it's every 90 days on certain solutions like ours, it's every year and other solutions maybe. Um, but in that model, you have to say, okay, here's more capability that should be offering me some advantage, should be offering some more, some optimization, should be offering me more, better, faster, whatever. And which of those really makes sense and in, in, in include that for us, right? So it is, it is a little bit uh, more challenging, a little bit more of a continuous evaluation process from that, that perspective, the SaaS than, than would ever have been in an op framework. So, so maybe Blake, help me out on that one, right? So, you know, I am a user of an older solution from my past. I've been a bare metal guy, right? Inside the warehouse, spoke about this on the podcast with Uday as well, right? Like that's the environment that I come from. And of course, I, I know quite a bit about the SaaS solutions now, but like anyone that's evaluating today, they got some fundamental questions, right? Okay, what you just said, that every quarter you're going to give me a drop of code or, you know, let's call it capabilities that are going to just come to me and I can use them. My traditional mindset would say, oh, 
any changes need to be rigorously tested before they go in. But I don't have control over this. You're just going to push it to everyone. How does that work? Like, what's your what's your advice to people that are looking to go down the SaaS path? Is that a resourcing question? Is that, hey, don't worry about it. We got such good automation. You don't need to worry about all of that stuff. Like, how does a person think about taking in new releases every quarter? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly, and, and 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 I will say it it is truly every quarter. And you know, we announced that at our user conference momentum, right? Our customers from a Manhattan Active WM perspective woke up and had a net new, entirely next gen yard management solution. It was just there and available to them at their disposal to go and adopt. Right now, the, the key caveat there is is that they are for them for them to adopt. It's not automatically turned on, right? So any new feature, be that something like as robust as a whole new yard solution or an incremental change to receiving, like you said, right? Those changes need to be configured, turned on, enabled, tested with your flow, et cetera. Um, now, what we commit to whenever you sign up for it from a SaaS perspective, and certainly other SaaS solutions should be making a similar commitment would be backwards compatibility, right? So whatever steady state you're operating and executing in today should not be broken by any of these new features. So they're configurable, they're adoptable, they're now available in your environment, but they're dormant at install. So right. the picking operator doesn't all of a sudden start seeing special instructions pop up because, because you know it was now available in a new release, right? If you didn't turn them on, you didn't interface them, of course, then, then their picking flow didn't change. Now you choose to adopt it, you choose to introduce those, you choose to turn them on, yeah, test them, promote them, et cetera. Uh, now, the, the key additional caveat there you said around, around testing, which is a, certainly a great one, right? The, the reality is, in, in, even in on-prem world, you still have to have pretty rigorous testing. You still took, uh, I think we called them SDNs back in the day, yeah, exactly. software delivery notification. Uh, we still call a, them that. I'm having what do a you service mean? Uh, PSO uh, flashback here. <laughs> um, you know, an SDN delivery, you still have to test those pretty rigorously, right, around those. Um, the advantage, I think, in a SaaS model is given that that backwards compatibility commitment, right, the APIs don't change over time. They're consistent in the way they are, is that that you can get to, and, and certainly we get to, uh, an automated testing space. So we have and continue to add uh, to our automation testing environment. So as we add these new features and functions, we're, we're automated testing them. And we, you know, certainly suggest our customers to to take advantage of the opportunity to do the same. And so you can, you know, there's a number of different tools out there and services I don't know to get into, but like, you know, you can get into those where you can say, hey, you know, we've made these little extensions or this is our very particular flow. This is the portion of the business that if it broke, we would be, you know, kneecapped and crippled. All of those sorts of things, those should be, you know, rigorously automated testing. And so in those ways, you know, it's not, it's no longer man, you know, man and machine, you know, conjunction on the keyboard, right? It's just machine, right? It's just the automation, just auto, running through your flows automatically uh, and, and ensuring that you're going to be consistently ex- be able to execute. That makes sense. And I mean, is there, you know, you look at your traditional resourcing, staffing, super users, et cetera, that you, you would expect companies to have, like, does the skill set also change for what you require to implement a, a cloud-based solution? Of course, Manhattan's helping or, you know, a software company's helping. But what kind of skill set should people be thinking about? Yeah, I think I think there's a number of things, um, you know, because we, you know, our perspective is certainly to enable customers from an extensibility side of things as well. So one certainly is, is testing what we just hit on there. But just to reiterate, having that kind of skill set no longer to, you still have to define the scripts, right? That was always a, a step. You have to, here's the stuff we want to come through and execute but rather than manually executing those each time, it's it's the development of the the automated tests, right? So that that skill set of leveraging whatever tool you're going to use, right, to to run them, but execute, run them, and then be able to add to them over time because your business is going to change and evolve, right? right? So so someone has to own that automation suite of testing and execution and 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 library of stories that are going to build and accrue over time, right? Um, then it's also, for instance, like the evaluation we said about you know, continuous release model, right? So there's always continuous innovation that you have to evaluate. Someone has to think about what should these things, you know, should we adopt? Should we go after? And if we're going to, how do they configure into our environment? How do they work with our workflows? What are the new you know, business cases for that, et cetera? And then, by the, oh, by the way, that feeds back into the testing guy, right? He's got to add a new test case, a new scenario, new, new things for the automation to make sure it's going. So it's... The, the individuals themselves, right, you know, having a super user who understands the system, the code, the configuration and things like that, certainly that, that same skill set, yep. the fundamental basis of both both worlds. It's just looking at it in a different light now, I think. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. 
makes a ton of sense. And I think maybe just like going back to, you know, releasing every 90 days. So um, that's super aggressive. I'm sure it's so well appreciated by the, the client base. In your seat, I would imagine you're having a lot of conversation. You're getting a lot of voice of customer feedback. You're, you know, you're help, you have a lot of inputs to, uh, to building out your product roadmap and exposure to a lot of things that are going on in the industry as it relates to, you know, innovation, um, automation. Would love to get your maybe top five things that you're really excited about as it relates to what's going on in, in supply chain, as it relates to, you know, product strategy and product development and, you know, what, what's, what you're most excited for that, that could be coming out in the next couple of years. Top five. We're getting, <laughs> we're getting big. Um, so, so there's a, there's, there's first and foremost at, at the forefront of really all of our solutions uh, roadmap is unification opportunities. Um, and so, you know, as I mentioned before, we, we just launched our, our yard management, uh, Manhattan Active Yard Management Solution, which unifies, the uh, you know, sits in between transportation and WM. It's all the same application there. Knowing things about WM and knowing things about transportation, all in a single application, we, we are able to uh, make more intelligent decisions in the yard. If I think about the warehouse specifically, for me, uh, automation always comes very, very top of mind. Um, you know, in my you know tenure at Manhattan, I've seen so many implementations where it was the okay, we're going to go add this new units order, we're going to go add this ASRS solution, we're going to go add these robots, right? When the robots sort of become the big thing, yeah. um, and and I think there's a world in the not too distant future where uh, and it, it exists today, but it will be, will become more prevalent where it'll be robots as a service, right? And so software as a service certainly exists, and, and, and SaaS is going to continue to grow. Um, robot as a service, I think, is there, uh, but not call it permeated throughout the entire market. I think it will eventually. And so more and more customers are going to find more interesting use cases for the, the true man and machine execution within their facilities. And so how we can not only react to that and, and help that, but also steer into it and really help enable it and understand that, you know, again, the labor we have a great understanding of how does that influence those man and machine decisions yep. and then the MHE execution understanding of their performance. How does that influence maybe the labor, right? Other areas that we're certainly interested in. Um, I mean, Sanjeev, our, our CIO said at our Remington main stage talking about LLMs, right? L large language model, right? This, uh, this is certainly, you know, touch of this, you know, very touch of the spear. I, it's not, I wouldn't even say tip of the spear because like <laughs> it's growing and it's evolving so fast right now. So I think, uh, a lot of people out there are trying to, you know, uh, really think about this problem. We certainly are trying to think about how this technology can can really be influential and and and, and, and assistive and adaptive into our solutions. Um, and I'm sure I mean, hope everyone else is. I'm sure they are, but but that's definitely probably number three. Other interesting areas we think that that you know as other technologies evolve, we want to be adapted to those as well. And so there's a number of things that that are coming out or have come out around vision based solutions that that. Um, can really provide more real time updates and, and like the, the technology for the AI to understand what it's seeing and interpret it and provide that information back is very interesting and cool. If we think about like movements of goods and, and, and movements of individuals and things like that, maybe it's more, more in that realm, but like there's a lot of interesting uh, uh, advancements in vision that like cameras and CCTVs, like it's not that anymore, right? It's, it's yep. well, well beyond yeah. that. That's pretty interesting. Um, and then, you know, for me personally, I would say, you know, other optimization things where we can really do things like with uh, machine learning or, or other AIs that, that uh, not not LLM related, because I know some people conflate these things, but um, other things where we can make better, more intelligent decisions for the end user and take that end user's, you know, tedious execution jobs out of their hands and, and really make it much more seamless and, and intuitive for the, for the system to provide. So no, I, I, and I agree with each Dude, one of those. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I, I agree with each one of those. What well, one I will add is I think when you put all of this together, um, unification, uh, LLMs and generative, uh, analytics and the information that you get robotics and man machine equation that comes into play. Um, I think what gets interesting is this term digital twin. I know it's been way overused out in the market, but within the warehousing space, like knowing if I move this, what happens? And it's not just warehouse, 
but now if you look at your entire supply chain it's like if i if i twist this what ends up happening or let me run a scenario of like a, a tsunami in some part of the world and what ends up happening to my supply chain and down to my execution at a warehousing level right we have the necessary compute power to be able to do that right like i th- i think it starts getting fairly exciting in some of the things you touched on right like robotics as a service yeah it's it's growing at a much rapider pace than we all can think of at this point and it's it's commoditization some of the amrs and agvs etc all of that's commoditized i know there is some really good players out in the market and mad respect to them but it's also getting commoditized so like the ras and accessibility to ras is out there for almost any warehouse operator you could be a 30000 square feet warehouse operator and go get robot if you have an actual use case to be able to go execute it right yeah it's it's pretty cool very cool so do we want to touch on um maybe go a little bit deeper into um what you're seeing on the AI side and how that's relating to warehouse operations i think a lot of buzz, a lot of noise, a lot of conversation going on. And and I think, as you, you mentioned, Blake, we're just kind of like, not, maybe not even the tip, right? We're just starting to figure out what it looks like because it, it is literally changing on a weekly, daily, monthly basis. Um, but maybe I think th- that conversation comes up a lot with us and with, with you know, the market kind of curious about where it's going or what the full potentials are. So... Um, I think between you and Anad, that could be a, a yeah. an amazing banter right there. And, and the folks that couldn't attend your uh, conference earlier this year, right? Like, you know, touching on like, what, what what was it that you guys are talking about today? About where do you see LLMs kind of coming in and play as an example? And what can it do? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's again, I, I a thousand percent reiterate this. It's like the, the, the very first point of the sphere right. because it's just, it's, it's so growing and crazy, but, but we definitely see some opportunity, no doubt. Right. And so some of the things that, you know, Sanjeev hit on at, at, at the momentum main stage. And so I feel pretty comfortable talking about hopefully because it's uh, seen by thousands of people already. It's out there. there. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, so it's interesting. So obviously the first and foremost, the things like a, like a chat model. Now that's not more from a WM perspective because no one's chatting with themselves in WM, but from our Omni side of things, right. In the Omni world, right. We have a lot of end user uh, exposure there. Right. And so be that through digital self-service, which is like an app that you can dial on your phone and, and check on things or, or just like calling into a customer call center or something like this, right. Like, like having a chat enablement um, is, is something that, you know, Really, that's what ChatGPT does already today, right? You go ask it a question, it provides you an answer. Now, it could do all that within the context of the Omni solution, right? Where's my order? Where, how's it going? Right? Things like this. Now, we, we think about that in the supply chain execution space in a little bit different way on, for, for instance, like, could it ask questions about, you know, how, how I could go implement some level of a capability, right? So it's, it, is, it is a chat, but it's not like an end user chat. It's like a super user chat. Like the super user asking MAWM, right? What is you know what is radial put away, right? And and how does that work? And how do I implement that, right? And and things like that. And um, yeah, that'd be you know interesting. I think it'd be more interesting if you could take it a step further and say, I'm interested in doing radial put away. Here are my inputs, right? My aisles, my bays, like my my parameters of range, and could it go? automatically configure that i don't know right put it test it here's an lpn that i'm going to then put away where would you send me right right and and how would that work right oh and by the way i have a mod i have this special logic that the system doesn't do today so when it's when it's considering this radio put away i also need you to consider this additional constraint could you code that mod for me and deploy that in the environment and see right like i and LLMs theoretically could do all of those things given yep. the right right feedback and education. And and I don't know that we personally have any kind of limitation on what we're considering today. Like today, everything's on the table. We're at yep. the very, very front of the spear and and we are certainly looking at those and other opportunities. I, I say other because there's a whole team of product managers, right? And so I'm sure they're thinking of other things as well that that you know you know Adam and I aren't necessarily thinking about yet, but um, you know, that's the direction I think that that at least from a WM perspective, it could start start to really work. And I think that's probably applicable in other spaces as well. 
Yeah, the thing with LLMs, like you know, when it came in general use for all of us, the first thing that I learned was it's actually limited by my ability to ask it questions, right? Like it, that's what you realize, right? Like, so rather than even go in like, hey, I want to try out a radial around active type situation and give me, it's like, I'm looking for 10% efficiency in my active picks. What would you recommend? And then go run the simulation for each one of them and come back and tell me what works best, right? And now take that result and actually go apply it, right? For a one hour test pilot for a set of orders or something. Like you could literally just keep going down that path of like making improvements around it. I also feel, right? Like it's it's not just the config side. It's also also the the management side. I, I said this on a previous podcast and I've been saying it for a while. I think we don't need graphs and charts. We are terrible at reading graphs and charts, right? Like just tell me what I need to do. Tell me the things that are important to me and go fix them, right? Like that's what, and I, Uday gave a really good graphs. example. He said, yeah. you know, we are going to go backwards. Back it's going to be all textual, right? Like everything's going to be text-based rather than going down the path of like user interfaces that we have gone down. So. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, the other point said you okay, was you know the future of coding isn't in C plus plus or Java or it's in English it's in it's in you know Mandarin yeah. it's in like it's no law because because if you can speak to it in your native tongue yep. and it can respond back and it can perform the action on the back end the way you need it to why did you need to you know you never had to learn uh, Java or C plus plus or what have you right. It's so amazing, yeah. man. That is I can't amazing. wait for the universe that's about to come specifically for the <laughs> operators and making their life easier. Um, operators will still complain. I can see that out loud. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, but to your point, do. right, if you have some level of an alerting or some level of a uh, communication, right, if it can predict there's going to be a problem because it understands the way things are going and what it expects will be happening next because it's evaluating that. And then it says, hey, we think we're behind. And, and, and oh, by the way, here's the four different things I think you could choose between to, to resolve that problem. Like, yeah, go get it. Solve it. Yeah. Solve it. Exactly. I, I love it, man. Yeah. Love it. At least at least in my experience, my, my supervisors and, and GMs and things like that, I've worked in warehouses, they still would want to be presented with their options and choose. Now, they might get to the... Again, 10 years ago, we weren't talking about SaaS-based WM solutions either. So, you know, right. 10 years from now, maybe they'll be willing to let it just automatically go through. But at least today with what we're talking about, if you could predict and present and allow for the user to choose and then based off the approval and, and, and you know, uh, uh, say, yep, go with option A and go execute. I think that would be just exactly. light years ahead. Right? And I mean, I'm. And I, I think, you know, the it would be injustice if we didn't actually bring up the other side of this conversation, right? Like we spoke about SaaS and its implementation, but SaaS also brings this ecosystem of APIs, right? Like this, this ability to do things that you didn't have before. So I think, you know, having you on the podcast and not talking about the the full suite of capabilities that now developers or users, right? Like super users now that they have, could you kind of give a little bit of color to like the API ecosystem that's available as we move to cloud? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we literally consider our API like one of our products, right? Now it's not one that we directly sell, right? You buy a solution and the solution has API underneath it, but we have a specific product manager who's dedicated to technology and API is part of that under his suite. And so uh, enabling our customers to leverage that, right? That's basically his job is just figuring out better and more fast and more effective ways for that. And, and, you know, when we talk about you know, the first, call it the end of my life in Manhattan, right? We, we had, we called them extensions or we called them modifications or we called them whatever, right? But you were changing code and that code existed in the base solution, right? This is the way it was. That, that none of that exists in the SaaS model, right? And, and frankly, it can't because it, it breaks our backwards compatibility commitment because you would start to change the base APIs that we've committed to say, hey, these will never change. So you can't can't do that. So truly, when you're in this SaaS model, when you're any kind of you know cloud deployment, it's truly an extension. It's, it's, it's external to the base product, right? It has to be. Otherwise, nothing, nothing works. And so that's the enablement that we feel certainly key to, to our customer success and 
there's a number of tools out there that we provide, but certainly other SaaS customers, you know, uh, or solutions would, would love to, to implement. Ours is called Proactive. That's the tool we we do sell and deploy. Um, it comes with you know your solution to any of our Manhattan X of uh, solutions. So from an MAWM perspective, our customers. Uh, we have a dozen or so plus that are that are using this today, and and the customer or one of their third party integrators, or sometimes they have a, have a middleman of services provider is doing it, but they're enabled to make their own extensions, right? They're looking up and understanding what the APIs are. They're writing their own API to say, okay, I'm going to call this base thing. I'm going to figure out what I need to do, and then call this other base API, right, and make this update. All of that's being done more or less without. You know, Manhattan intervention or, or involvement at all. Uh, they they might tell us they were doing this. We want to know, great, but like you went and executed it, and you deployed it, and then you promoted it. Now it's in production. Awesome, love to hear it. And so, I mean, th- that from that perspective, really, you know, enabling our customers and and their partners to to perform their own extensions, to perform their own customizations, for lack of a better term, to the solution is certainly, I think, key. And and the the root of all of that is understanding the API and understanding what's available. And there are thousands of API now that are available. So a lot to get through that library. And I think, I think that's where, you know, developers and partner ecosystem needs to start looking at it and trying to figure out what can be done, right? Like it's, it's, it's enhancing the product further by bringing newer capabilities that play outside. Like you just touched on, um, computer vision, right? Like cameras and what they can do today, right? There is so many use cases that you could go deploy right now that you could go like tap into the CCTV systems of your, you know, warehouse and touch the API to figure out who's actually passing through. I'm just, the the world's your oyster, oyster when you want to actually start utilizing something of that nature. It's Yeah, yeah we, had a, we had a customer who was literally doing exi- essentially that. They were tapping into uh, a camera-based solution. I forget. I think they added the camera, though. So it wasn't their their existing CCTV. Yeah. But they added the camera to understand uh, induction labor to a unit sorter. And so the unit sorter was doing its own thing, doing its own diverts and its own interaction with the WM. But the operators are physically performing a task, yeah. and they weren't tracked. So yeah. prior to this implementation, they had zero tracking to these operators and their execution, their throughput, their performance. Couldn't do any of it on standard, right? Would have no idea. The camera this solution understood the operator, who it was, and the rate that they were performing the moves, and yep. started feeding LM that data by understanding it, and again, calling the API, right, and saying, hey, this is the labor that we're tracking for this yep. user. Here's all the puts they're doing. It didn't come from WM. WM calls those APIs naturally, of course. It came from this other solution, this extension, that was yep. essentially a camera-based labor monitor. Yeah. Beautiful, right? Very interesting. Very yeah, it's interesting. beautiful. You know, one other one that I'll also throw out there that I've been noodling. So you mentioned, right, like the inventory solid, like, you know, the system does what the system needs to do. Retail compliance is a huge area. When 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 you start thinking about there is a human aspect of retail compliance, you can get the right labels, the right size of pallet, you can cube it right, all of that systemically well done. But if you don't put the right slip sheet and you don't apply the label in the right corner, right? Like all of these other manual inputs that go into making a retail shipment compliant. If I knew what shipment sitting at a given lane at a given dock door and the camera is actually watching it, I could figure out how compliant that shipment is going out the door. And that represents, you know. A, a humongous amount of savings right there. If you just make sure your shipments going out are compliant. Right. Like I know that's a Walmart shipment. I know exactly what needs to happen to that shipment. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, this has been, uh, this has been amazing, Blake. Really appreciate you joining us and and thank you for being on the show again. Um, maybe as we wrap things up, um, just want to give you the opportunity to, to plug Manhattan, maybe, uh, share with the, uh, the audience where they could go to learn more about. Uh, what's going on, learn a little more about active and, uh, and any social channels that you're on where they could, uh, where they could follow you. Yeah. So certainly on LinkedIn, uh, our, our marketing team is is very active about publishing and, and making sure everyone's aware of the, the new, new and cool stuff that we're doing and, and also uh, customer stories. So if you're interested in learning more about, you know, how our customers are showing success, uh, they're, they're, they're very active in, in, in publishing those, which is fantastic. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn, of course, so by, by all means, follow me there. Uh, but yeah, so 
Shameless plug, Manhattan Active Supply Chain. It's the best, most unified solutions ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, it really is fantastic. I'm really excited to be on this side of the of, of the the overall you know supply chain software world now because it's. It's really, it's really just an exciting space where uh, a lot of uh, opportunity for uh, real innovation and real, real forward thinking and and impact. Frankly, right, you know, impact to our customers and their execution and their customers, right, their customers' customers. So, um, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful space to be in. I'm very happy to be here. Amazing. Thank you. Amazing. Thanks again, Blake. Hi, I'm Ninada Charya, CEO and co-founder of Fulfillment IQ. And I'm here with Dan Call, CRO and partner at Fulfillment IQ. We're the team behind the Ecom Logistics Podcast. Our mission is to provide you with genuine insights from our work alongside logistics leaders to help you improve your supply chain. In the Ecom Logistics Podcast, we share the knowledge and the insights we've gained from working alongside amazing brands, retailers, 3PLs, and VCs, so you can make the most out of your supply chain journey. If you like what you're hearing, we truly appreciate your support with a five-star rating on your favorite podcasting channel. Your feedback not only keeps us going, but also helps others find the podcast. If you think Fulfillment IQ can assist you, or if you have an idea related to logistics, just reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm always up for a chat and ready to explore new possibilities together. Stay tuned to the Ecom Logistics Podcast on your favorite podcast platform for fresh and practical insights into e-commerce and logistics. Until next time, let's keep making a difference in logistics together.